Hey, good morning, everybody. On the 3 one Synergy Group call, we have a lot of folks that are still just kind of joining in, so we're going to wait probably two or three minutes uh, before we start the presentation. You're in the right place. Uh, thanks for joining, and we'll be uh, getting started shortly. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 301 Synergy Group, best practice sharing what's new in the world of CRM. Uh, we thank you for taking the time out of your busy morning and sharing, or giving us the opportunity to share with you. Uh, to go over a couple things as we get started, the call is being recorded and it will be posted on the csweek.org website under the 301 Synergy Group uh, banner. The calls do have the audio recorded, so you get not just the slides, but all the audio as well, and uh, the question and answer. So feel free to make it a participative call, um, even though it's kind of a one-way sort of a thing. If this is your first time on a Synergy Group call, what we try to do is create a forum for people with an interest in having uh, general customer service for their area. Some Cities have a three-on-one center, some don't, performing the same function, and this call, this group is designed to foster that communication. If you're interested, if you're established, if you're growing, uh, in any of those areas, you want to try and foster communication uh, between folks that are interested in that. And we get together three ways. Two of them are virtual. Uh, this is one of them, where we have webinars like this almost every month. We also share both content and uh, the ability to contact each other on LinkedIn. And so if you are not a member of LinkedIn, we recommend that you join LinkedIn and then go search for the 311 Synergy Group. You can request to join the group, and uh, we'll get back to you uh, with that and let you participate in that group. The other way we participate is through an in-person annual conference in the spring. And next year we're going to be in Tampa, uh, August, not August, but April 20th, 28th to the 30th, so right there at the end of April. Um, and we would love it if you could come down to Tampa. We try to have a great mix of both content and networking. So not only do you have a chance to, to listen from people who have done things, but also plenty of chance just to, to break up and get in a small group and, and talk about what's going on, uh, you know, either with other cities or with some of the vendors that participate. Uh, and we really encourage you to join us. You can take a look at csweek.org and uh, click on the Throne One Synergy Group link and get full details about that conference. Uh, 
we um, have picked this topic uh, for today. Actually, let me, let me introduce myself. Um, I am Andy, Andy Maimoni. I'm the Deputy Director of the San Francisco 301 Customer Service Center. We've been doing this for uh, five or six years. We're pretty well established, um, and we are you know, one of the larger groups, and we really enjoy taking the time to share with uh, other cities, either large or small, uh, planning stages, established stages. Uh, Esther is our vice chairman, and she is division manager for the city of Albuquerque. Um, again, just you know, the two of us working together, trying to make an environment for you to be able to, to share and, and learn. Um, as I said, the a April meeting coming up in Tampa, uh, two and a half you know, great days of discussions and content management or content sharing. And we are actively you know, looking for your input about you know, what it is uh, that you would like to um, to know. If you want to go out to the 3 one Synergy Group uh, site on, on LinkedIn and, you know, post comments about what you would love to see us talk about in the April meeting, it's not too late to customize uh, the content to meet your needs. We're going to have our next webinar coming up on January 30th at 10 o'clock, uh, and look for announcements about that coming up. We, as I said, we do our communication primarily through LinkedIn on the Synergy Group. You can also go to csweek.org and uh, you know, take a look at what we've got out there. So our webinar today is, um, you know, again, the best practice, what's new in the world of CRM. And we picked this topic today uh, because a lot of us use this time of the year to look into the future and you know, see what needs to get done see what is either in my budget or missing from my budget. We are starting budget talks now, so it's a great time to be able to say, that's a great idea. What do I need to do to, to get that implemented? And so we've invited two of our sponsors from 2012 to share the feedback that they've gotten while they've been out in the field talking to customers, because they're out there you know, pretty much every day, and they're hearing you know, frustrations, they're hearing successes, and based on that, um, we ask them to share just what they see coming up for, for next year. Uh, our first presenter is going to be Chris Hoover from Oracle. He's got 16 years experience with Oracle and right now. Uh, he is currently the customer experience, um, uh, he's leading the customer experience solutions team uh, for the Oracle public sector. They're doing a lot of work in that area. He has um, been in the state, local, federal government uh, sector uh, for years across both the U.S. and Canada. And then following Chris is going to be Steve Carter uh, with Kana, uh, Kana Inc. He has been an account manager and product ma manager for Kana uh, for the past you know, four or five years. Again, also working with accounts in the U.S. and Canada. He's been in the 301 space for uh, about 15 years and really knowledgeable in that. And so we are very, very welcome to have you know, both of these you know, individuals come and share their information. The format of the call is going to be uh, the presentations from Chris and Steve. We will take questions at the end. And uh, if you have questions that you have, you want to go ahead and use the Q&A uh, tab to the right-hand side of your uh, toolbar on the right. Type your question in the bottom, and you, you can post that in. What we will do is we will queue up all of the questions for the end, and uh, we will go through them. And what we'll do is we'll offer up the question to both panelists and get their insight for both. Um, for simplicity in the whole call, and, and uh, especially for the Q&A, um, we're not muting everybody, uh, but please use the mute button so that you know, we can get a good audio uh, recording. And feel free to drop the call and rejoin us if you get a call instead of putting us on hold. Um, the last administrative thing is there is a little uh, conversation bubble with a checkbox, and you can use that if uh, if we are going you know too slow, too fast, uh, you know, and just uh, give us a little bit of feedback as we're going along. So what I'd like to do now is turn it over to uh, Chris Hoover, who is the senior consulting uh, sales consulting manager over at Oracle, and he is going to be giving us uh, his first glimpse into 2013. So, Chris, go ahead. Okay. 
Thanks, Andy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. So I've got 15 to 20 minutes here today, and I just want to uh, go through some of the experiences that we've seen as we, we've been working with customers uh, over the past few years and as we see uh, the future unfolding, as Andy said, in 2013. So. At the heart of it, citizens are consumers. They are customers. And as such, they want to have the same level of customer service, this, the same number of options in, in dealing with those organizations, whether they're dealing with their local grocery store, Best Buy, Nordstrom, Amazon, or their city or local government. And you can see there the different uh, areas of, of interaction, whether it's in person in a store, calling to a contact center, chatting uh, you know, on their mobile device, going on Facebook, whatever it might be. These are the channels that people are use, becoming used to when they deal with these organizations. So uh, city and local governments need to keep up with that. They need to be aware that this is where their citizens are going. So when we think about the, the customer journey, that citizen journey across a, a typical experience, think about the last big purchase you made. Was it a big screen TV, a smartphone, a vacation, or a car? Now think about all the, the things that went into that purchase. You know, with the big screen TV, did you look at online reviews? Did you check them out in person in a, in a Best Buy or in a, any other store? For a smartphone, did you talk to your friends who have the iPhone or maybe somebody else who has the Galaxy 3? For your vacation, did you go on TripAdvisor and read all the online reviews? Did you talk to uh, you know, some friends who had gone to Europe versus some friends who went to Mexico? Did you got their input? When you bought your car, you went to the dealership, but did you read the online reviews before and, and get input from other sources? The answer is probably yes to all of those. So think again about, you know, for a citizen, whether, you know, it might be somebody moving to the area, they're checking out uh, local government services, maybe the schools, uh, you know, somebody starting a business. Where's the best place to start? Is there a loan program for a certain area of the city or county? Uh, are there ty what type of licenses do I need to get? Look at all of those channels, web, contact center, uh, mailing, brochures, mobile, et cetera. All of those, this is where all the whole journey comes into play, and it can be across all those different areas. So we want to make sure, again, that we are capable of meeting the customer need, uh, the customer expectation on each of those. So what does define a, a great customer experience? Obviously, we need a consistent voice. We want to be seamless across all channels. So that means whether someone's picking up the phone, chatting with us, sending an email, going online, and submitting a web request, it, there's a consistent answer to uh, any of those. And we want those interactions to be connected. So what that means is if, if I call a contact center on Monday, but I you know, send an email on Tuesday or start a chat on Wednesday, I want the agent on the other end of that to know the entire background. Think about the last bad customer experience you had where you called in and, you know, they, they didn't solve your problem. You had to call back, and rather than picking up where you left off, they, they expected you to just go through the entire problem again. You had to re-explain everything, give your name, all the information. It's a, it's a very frustrated, frustrating experience for the customer. So we want to connect those interactions and make sure that there's one central location for all, a record of those interactions, regardless, again, of the channel that they come in on. Personalized journey. We want to make that person, that citizen, feel like they are being attended to because of who they are. Uh, even if it, this is a, a question we run into day after day after day, thousands of times, we want to make sure that that person feels like we are paying attention to them. And we want to be efficient, not only for the customer. I mean, obviously, that's, that's great for the customer. It's a great experience to, to have that first contact resolution. You make a call, you get your solution, and it's, and it's over with. But also on the back end, we want to be efficient because it's cheaper. First when you can resolve a, uh, a problem with one call or one contact, it, it's a much cheaper interaction from a, a contact center perspective as well. And we want that uh, citizen to feel rewarded. We want them to feel like this is something that, you know, I, 
they feel pride in in the city they live in, the locality. They want to feel rewarded in knowing that they're being uh, attended to. So that constituent experience. Again, it's about the relationship between the citizens and government. Uh, and this goes back to the beginning where uh, you know, citizens, they expect just as in a consumer relationship where it's proven that uh, consumers are willing to pay more for an item if they know they're going to receive good customer service. Well, it's the same way with, with government. Uh, a study has shown that 42% uh, of Americans uh, would pay more in taxes for better customer experience. And, and think about that today in today's economy. People will actually are willing to pay more in taxes just for better service. And no, no surprise there, but 83% of Americans do say that uh, they, they think government agencies can provide uh, a better level of customer service. So when we go about city service, we, we understand that these interactions, our, our activities can impact uh, perceptions of our citizens. So here we have an example. We've got some road work going on. So many different ways that this can impact our our citizens, whether they're a business owner, you know, this is this is cut off traffic to my business, or this is where I pick up the local bus, or, you know, I live nearby, but the, this work starts at 6.30 in the morning or 7 in the morning, and it wakes me up in the morning. So, uh, and then personal safety, uh, you know, there's a, a, a fire uh, hydrant blocked, where's, where's the next one? So these are all things that, you know, based on one type of activity, so many different perceptions, so many different ways of looking at a customer service and how a, a citizen is affected by that, that we need to be aware of this. And uh, not just from a reactive situation, but from a proactive situation. So if we know this is going to happen, maybe we can proactively reach out to citizens in the area or to businesses in the area and make sure that they're aware. We can post alternative uh, bus routes or uh, pickup locations. So these are all things that we can do ahead of time to make sure that uh, the impact is lessened as much as possible. So when we look at the constituent experience, again, what are the, what are the challenges that we're running into? Uh, well, first, they want to be constituents, just like a, in a consumer relationship, they want to be able to connect when it's convenient for them, not just when a, a government office is opened. So 24-7 web self-service, making sure that they can always have a channel, uh, even if you don't have staff on at that hour, there is a channel for them to go where they can find answers to their questions. Limited channels available. Uh, the changing demographics uh, demand that additional channels be made available. Uh, the story I always like to tell around this is my uh, my stepson. Uh, I was going to take him over to a friend's house, and he had yet to get the address. So I asked him to call his friend, get the address, and we would be on our way. Well, he starts to text his friend, and uh, and. You know, I let him go for a little bit, and then I started to admonish him to say, hey, just pick up the phone, let's call, get the address. Before I'd even gotten the sentence out of my mouth, he already had the text back with his friend's address. And it's because this is how uh, younger generations communicate. And we find this true across a lot of different uh, customers that I work with, uh, but particularly as uh, – you know, through that uh, 18 to 30 to 34 range, we see a lot of demand for mobile device interaction, uh, availability for chat, making sure that, uh, again, these different demographics have availability of the channels that they are becoming used to interacting with organizations. And obviously the age-old problem, spending too much time on hold, waiting for resolution, waiting for an email to update us. and this really comes back to uh, that efficiency in the interaction, making sure that whether uh, someone is waiting for an email or uh, you know they're waiting on the phone, we want to make sure that that customer service agent, that help desk representative, that they have information at their fingertips, that they have a knowledge uh, 
the information, the knowledge base, et cetera, within the, the console that they are working off of uh, all in one place so that they don't have to, you know, scroll through multiple applications, pull down the three-ring binder off the, the shelf in front of them. We want to put that right in front of them. We want to be able to suggest uh, resolution to them so that they can help as quickly as possible to that caller on the phone. Limited visibility uh, into a city service standards. This is all about accountability. And in today's economy, people want to know what they're getting for their tax dollars. And, and this comes back to being able to, uh, you know, the analytics, that reporting, being able to report on how effective were uh, our, our agents when it came time for, you know, those calls that came in. We handled uh, thousands of calls. We our average handle time was this. It improved this much over the previous month, and it was based on uh, an investment in this technology. There are all things that we want to be able to tie directly back to the money spent. We want to make sure that there is a return on investment so that we can show the constituents, again, what they're getting for the money that they're paying in taxes. And local community outreach, getting the visibility and attention it's necessary for it to be effective. Uh, we're actually working with a large city in the Midwest and uh, their mayor and uh, city council, very proactive. They, they're always out in the community uh, doing outreach. Um, problem is that, uh, you know, getting publicity for it, making sure that citizens are aware of it uh, before, you know, it's reported on the news or before it shows up on the website as, you know, the mayor was out and did this. We want to make sure that we're proactively uh, reaching out to the community to let them know what is available to them from that outreach perspective. So just very quickly, I want to talk about how uh, right now fits into uh, the solution. And you can see there we've got several experiences in terms of how our constituents will be interacting uh, with us. And on the left, you see the, the right now, uh, the web experience. This is self-explanatory, but for the most part, this is where that web self-service takes place. So you have a citizen, again, no matter what time it is, day or night, they can go online, find answers to questions. We have uh, something called guided assistance, so we can take that self-service to the next level. Guided assistance is sort of that uh, decision tree capability where we allow for uh, customers to take themselves through a, uh, a decision tree to find exactly uh, the solution they're looking for to maybe a more complex problem than, you know, let's say, for instance, they're looking for a certain type of business license. We've got to ask multiple questions to really drill down into finding exactly what they need. We can do this with guided assistance. Making sure that any email that comes in, any request off of a web form, all goes into the same queue for our uh, back-end agents. Uh, being able to route that intelligently, making sure that uh, you know, it doesn't spend any more time in a, in a holding pattern than necessary. When those requests come in, we want to make sure that they are driven exactly to the group or individual who can handle that, that request. And again, with the uh, the capabilities uh, with chat, being able to uh, allow that channel uh, for, uh, again, for demographics uh, that are used to it. And one thing to uh, be aware of around the chat and uh, also mobile capabilities is those can be done for relatively low cost. Uh, and right now, in this case, we can enable uh, mobile capabilities by checking a box. It literally is that easy, so it's, it's another low-cost channel. Chat, we find that uh, the skill set for those uh, chat agents on the back end are very similar to those uh, who answer emails or, or the web requests that come in. So the nice thing about chat is that it can be done, it really increases the first contact resolution because it's more of a conversation. Even though uh, it's written conversation, it's, there's back and forth. Whereas email, you've got to send in, wait for the reply, you know, and that can go back and forth over hours or even days. So we want to make sure that, you know, with something like chat, again, the same skill set on the back end for your agents, but you're adding a channel that really does improve uh, the efficiency and uh, customer satisfaction. On the social side, obviously, uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of cities uh, become more and more social, and that means whether they have a Facebook page, uh, whether they're out on Twitter, uh, YouTube, et cetera, 
they want to know how their citizens are interacting with them, how they're talking about them. So we have capabilities to allow you to monitor uh, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. You can go out there, put in search terms, get back uh, tweets or Facebook posts about uh, your city, about programs that you're uh, offering, making sure that if there are any customer service issues or, in, for that matter, any uh, PR or public affairs issues, we're addressing those as they come in. We don't want to be reactive and find out about something uh, you know, in, in the news. On the contact center side, uh, this is really about how those customers will interact with your agents. So we, the, at the end of the day, we want to make those agents as efficient as possible, whether that means providing them with scripts uh, so that they can take uh, an end user through a process without being an expert on that process. We've got uh, a changing desktop so that you can allow for um, – depending on the type of request coming in, you only show the agent exactly what they need to solve that problem. So it can be a very dynamic, uh, on-the-go uh, type of response to the request coming in from that caller. And we have other, other things where we can add in with CTI media bars, being able to uh, automatically show based on, say, the if the caller has a, a menu available to them, they punch in the, the, the type of question they have, or if they've got an existing uh, contact record, we can look them up and we can present all of this information to the agent before they answer the phone. So the agent is prepared to uh, confirm the, the identity of the caller and then begin immediately into continuing the resolution of that issue. So as you can imagine, this, say, this can shave uh, literally minutes off of a call interaction. And as you uh, amortize that out over thousands of calls, hundreds of thousands of calls over the course of a year, that can save you quite a bit of, of money. So lastly, I'll talk about our engage piece. This is really where uh, we do engage with the consumer, with that citizen. This is about uh, reaching out. Uh, doing outreach, we have an email capability. So this is where I talked about with that, uh, with the mayor and the outreach uh, that that really wasn't getting out there like he wanted to. So what we can do is enable through both the web and through email channels and through SMS text, we can actually reach out proactively and and give people information ahead of time so that they know about certain activities uh, that the the city is. Um, doing with outreach. Lastly, we want to be able to, uh, across all of these channels, across all of these efforts, we want to be able to report and do analytics. So we've got about 650 out-of-the-box reports, but you want to be able to be flexible. You want to be able to uh, report on exactly what's important to you. So you want to have the flexibility to uh, take those reports and uh, make them more applicable to uh, your own city's business, your own business processes, and also uh, what you're responsible for reporting to not only maybe city council or the mayor, uh, state government, et cetera, but also to the citizens. Uh, we, we've got some localities that we work with who will put that information out on the web. So it's very nice to be able just to print those reports, uh, export them to HTML, and, and put them out on the web page. So it's very nice in terms of that accountability phase with the citizenry. And at this stage, I think I'm just about out of time, so I'm going to wrap it up. And uh, again, we'll take questions at the end of the uh, presentation. And at this point, I will turn it over to Steve. All right. Thanks very much, Chris. Make sure I've got control here. One of the things I'm going to talk about today that Andy asked us to talk about was, um, and obviously we know we've got a lot going on. There's a lot of things that come on that are new, but one of the challenges that's not necessarily new to government is the fact that they're having to deal with doing more with less and that we've got tighter budgets and other things. So we've got a, a presentation that I'm going to cover today talking a little bit about you know, that we're living kind of in the age of austerity. And what that means is what are we going to do for customer service and what does that mean to our citizens? So one of the things I want to do is give you some direction today on kind of where we're going to go with this is I'm going to kind of explain what we mean by the digital customer and um, 
talking about the, today's citizen and, and sort of how they interact with us. And then the fact that with tighter budgets and other things, what are we going to, you know, what's the right way to bring technology to bear to deal with some kind of problem like that? And uh, I'm going to cover and talk about that as we go forward. The, the real things we look at is the fact that things have changed. Today's digital citizen is mobile. You're not necessarily knowing where they're going to be when they're talking with you. And the things we get into is that we see that there is new channels and things that we didn't have up until 2003. We had never really heard of Skype. 2004, Facebook came along. And this 2006, we suddenly saw Twitter. We see a lot of transactions. And the interesting thing is those channels are brand new, and they just got added. And, you know, government tends to have to deal with that when that comes along and that happens. But the fact that our citizens aren't necessarily doing business with us the way they were in the past is really the whole point here. One of the key things we want to note is that since 2010, there have been 6 million new users of the Internet. And that just gives you an idea of, of the types of transactions we're seeing and the growth in that market space. So the idea that we've got a lot going on, you know, we've got a large percentage of users. In some cases, 32% of citizens are doing transactions with the government online. 27% of those users are actually filling out electronic forms. This is data that we've been collecting and working with in our, our customers across North America, Australia, and the United Kingdom, and in some places in Europe, where the approach to public sector is looking at pushing more and more of those services online. And some of the figures that we get into, you know, is that, that we've got 18% of our users are age 65 and over, and that's going to grow, especially in North America. So we're getting to the point that in some cases we've got these great new channels, but the fact that we've got a large percentage of our customers who may not be on using these channels means we've got to continue to support the traditional ways, phone calls, counter service approach that maybe the older customer base likes. But as, those, as that older customer base gets more adapt with the younger uh, crowd, then we can see if that's a way we can cross, you know, use between those that we can have technology running on both platforms. When we talk about austerity measures, we're, so we're hearing some first from our customers. We've got around 250 local governments that we do customer service solutions for around the world. And one of the interesting things is we begin to hear for the first time that contact centers may not be the priority given their cost. I know we, we're aware of some cities who've chosen to implement solutions and be totally online, just launch mobile applications, but they're not going to have that traditional contact center. So that's kind of a switch. We, we haven't seen a major move in that direction in North America yet, but we've seen some cities considering it. And the fact that our customer base that has these contact centers are maybe looking to us to say, well, we're going to, our call center is not going to be 24 hours a day anymore. It's going to it's going to shorten its operational hours, or we've got fewer staff. You know, how do we deal with that? And what are some things that we're putting into the product roadmaps and bringing technology in to help survive and and live through that uh, transition period? But that's kind of an interesting approach. That that's really the biggest impact is people are going to have less budget, less staff, less people, and they've got to still deliver the same service. If in some cases not try to figure out ways to deliver it even better. And in this case, a lot of people are just not sure what to do. And one of the things that we see is that, you know, when you get into that situation, more likely you're spending your budget to keep things the way they are. And let's continue to do what we did last year. But with your call volumes going up, with the number of citizens coming online increasing, with the number of people wanting to do things with you in mobile, and the fact that you want to be more responsive and do more with less, that really can lead to a, a sometimes complications in what the approach is going to be to, to solve this with technology. So a couple things I want to talk about is the fact that one of the things that this new technology gives us is an idea. In this case, you see this meerkat, and this meerkat's out there, and he's on alert. We've got customers now who are realizing, you know, in some cases, maybe we ought to see what, what can we take advantage of. The fact that we've got social media and more and more of our citizens are doing smartphones and to give government organizations a new sense of what's going on out there. We've got a customer of the city of Boston who has actually got applications citizens can download now, put them on their phone, and it uses the accelerometer on the phone as they ride around the city to report pavement conditions. So you begin to get an example that, in some cases, this, this technology change is overwhelming. 
a lot of people are out there, but now you can say, you know what, I can use this now. I can turn those citizens into sensors and many reporting uh, locations that can tell us what's happening, what's going on in their neighborhoods, and see that information, whether they're doing it with an application or they're doing it because they're posting things on Facebook. We can get that information. The next thing is to begin to gauge that sentiment and, and look at maybe we can change how we do business or the way we communicate with citizens. So the idea that we can get real-time, unfiltered views of public policy and what citizens think about that. In some cases, we may be able to get intelligence about things going on uh, that may be affecting public safety, and in most cases, criminal threats, but it may give you an idea of what is happening out there that maybe someone's not traditionally going to call you and complain about. But the fact that it's happening and it's going on, we can see that. You can get some indication that these things are coming. Uh, one of the neat things with some of the new social monitoring tools is the ability to tell you what emerging topics are. And I'll show you some examples of where we've got customers who are acting and choosing to act on that information today. And then you can proactively manage it. If you're realizing that people are confused about the new garbage pickup policies, or they're not sure about what zoning is going to do or the, the, what's going on in their neighborhood or how it will affect you know, certain issues they may have an interest in, you really can determine, you know what, we, we seem to see a lot of chatter about that. Let's do a new press release. Let's get the mayor out there to talk about it. Let's call some, you know, meetings in the neighborhoods. And you can go out and hopefully even solve the problem before they call and complain about it, which ideally would be the most effective way of doing customer service. And, of course, the citizens don't want to pay more. They don't want to pay for transactions. They don't want to do other things. So the real key we we're looking at is we want to do this. We want to offer these services. And we want to try to make it where they feel like, you know, they're already, they're already paying their taxes. They're, they're paying for the customer service, but they're getting the service that, that they can get. And then also you're effectively delivering it to them at a, a good price point. One of the things we talk about is that we believe with our research that we've done and with the, the market analysts we work with, and talking to the customers we've got is that by 2020, we think phone-based communications will really be a small player in what we're doing today. Today, it's probably 80 to 90 percent of the transactions most of our customers deal with, but most of those customers are now realizing we're going to be communicating with citizens a whole different way. So we've got to be able to have technology and approach to do that. So in the in the look at what we do with public sector, the Lagan product family that Kana produces is aimed at this, and we really focus on the customer experience. And that's something that Kana uh, founded several years ago and has brought to market and bear, especially in the commercial side. And with our lagging products, we do it in the public sector side. And we really focus our whole approach around the, those experiences for the agents, the, the uh, individuals who are using the web, the social media users, and then the users who are on mobile devices who are out there. And that experience can apply whether they're internal city staff or they're just citizens. Uh, you know, if, if you think about it, if you want to arm your city councilmen and county commissioners and elected officials with mobile devices, tablets, so they can get to reports, they can see what's there, they can report issues, they can monitor what's going on. You, you know, we, we view them as just another type of user who needs a portal into the system. And with those types of applications we provide in today's tighter budgets, we're, we're seeing more and more options that where cities are considering, maybe we want this hosted off-site. Um, we haven't yet encountered someone who wants to actually outsource the entire call center, but we have sure heard about it. We do have customers in the UK who have done that already, where they've just decided to let a third party handle all calls, handle all emails, and they just basically get the results in the lagging solution, and they can then work on them and respond to them. But again, it gives you the idea that you've got we need choice and flexibility in today's budget times to say you may start off with a traditional in-house solution, and eventually you may want to take it to the cloud. We've seen just the opposite, where people who brought it in-house once costs have stabilized and they've got it down, and uh, their, their staff can manage it without having a lot of uh, third parties involved. When we talk about these experiences, obviously for the agent, you know, you, you want to take advantage of some of the really nice things you can do being context aware so that we can look up the questions, you know, 80% of transactions typically with most of our customers involve a search of a knowledge base to return an answer. So the idea is that once you get that answer back, you know, you, you want to provide that information, solve the call. The citizens now satisfied. They don't need to call you back again. And the idea that they may be looking at different types of things they're going to do. So we want to involve scripting, good knowledge search tools, the ability to quickly create requests, but 
again, driving things towards the agent who's got everything they need in an easy-to-use desktop that lets them uh, solve the question and get the answer the first time to the question the citizen has. Then we talk about self-service. And one of the big things here is that, obviously, anything we can do that allows a citizen to report something and have it go straight to the department is just one less thing we have to have a contact center employee to do. And it takes a load off what they're currently doing, and maybe it helps us more effectively manage the call queues for the calls we get today or the transactions and interactions we have. But the idea that they can go online and see things, it brings it all together on the web. And our concept here is, is making it a portal experience so that, you know, regardless of what they're doing, they can look at what's going on, they can see things on maps. Uh, if, if they viewed their interactions with government the way they view their interactions with their bank, which we think is the case, then what you're going to find is that they're going to say, well, I, I'm going to use the drive through I'm going to walk in and talk to a teller, I'm going to use my mobile app, I'm going to hit the ATM. If they think of government the same way, if they use mobile apps, if they call us at the call center, if they walk into City Hall, the idea is that they're going to, they're going to handle all those experiences the same, and they're going to be consistently across all those, and they're going to see all the same information. So if they're reporting apps by calling you at 311, and they're also reporting apps on their mobile phone, when they log into the portal and indicate who they are, if they've identified themselves in those transactions, they'll see them all in one experience. And that, that's the key for what we want to see is that they can put that information together and get into where they eventually get down to reporting it, and we can then tailor these solutions for them. And, and in some cases, we can uh, make it even better experience and that we can educate them a little bit that maybe they're calling to ask a question and not realizing the services are available, they can actually go ahead and immediately apply for that service or request it or whatever they need to do to initiate the process. When we talk about the social experience, um, Andy is one of our customers who uses Facebook to create uh, an interface to the lagging solution. And the idea there is if, if most of your citizens are already on Facebook, you know, if they want to you know, like your page and they're, they're friends with your city, and uh, they can go to your location and they can create a request there. Again, you're just making it easier for them they're online. Uh, we know that with the, the people who are age 18 to 21, or excuse me, 18 to 24, 91% of their transactions are done online. And that's how they do things. So that, as that group of people becomes, you know, homeowners and citizens living in your neighborhoods, they're, that's how they're going to want to transact with you. And when they're out there on the social media tools, uh, Chris had alluded to this earlier, there's a lot going on. So maybe they're chatting with their friends about, you know, how the condition of the local park. Maybe they're wishing people would do something about that graffiti in the neighborhood. The idea is you, you begin to capture information. One of our customers in New Orleans uh, used one of our tools and has been working this summer. And was we were looking at, you know, customer service issues and other things around the city. And one of the interesting things was that Hurricane Isaac showed up in the middle of this back on October 28th. And with these tools, obviously, they're always wanting to know what are people talking about, what's the sentiment out there. And the first thing you see was we saw the volume rising the few days before landfall occurred for the hurricane. But when it comes in, you get an idea that that's the vast majority of what's going on out there. Obviously, with that kind of a weather event, we know it's coming. There's a lot of chatter ahead of time. The biggest single driver in most of these um, social communications and the activity out there was the fact that the city announced we're not using the Superdome as a evacuation center this time, like they did during Hurricane Katrina. Well, that was the majority of the chatter. And they really were able to drill into these categories and began to see that, well, all those tweets, all those Facebook posts, all those messages on TripAdvisor, people who were wondering if they should cancel their, their visits to New Orleans, what are they going to do? All that information, you begin to get an idea of what's really the topic, what's driving the conversation. And the idea that we can take advantage of the fact that the social tools are so well used by citizens, we can mine that information and, and get an idea through these dashboards, panels, click charts you can drill into and see the information all the way down to the exact posts being made, and then you can choose to engage. And in that case, uh, that's where we see it is that we tied the, the CRM together with the social experience to say now every time you respond to a tweet or you post back a message on a Facebook page, we're tracking it in the CRM almost like if they'd have called you on the phone, this phone call, and now you've got a record of what you did. So you can, you can see that information. The next thing you get into is the mobile experience. And, but this has got to be one of the most fast-moving areas with all of our customers because there are third parties involved. We've got products that do this. There's the open 3 one standard now, which has you know, stabilized the way 
third parties can communicate with CRM solutions. And the idea that in, in our applications at Kana, we use Open 311 to communicate with all of them. And the idea that we can exp extend and expand beyond that is really the big thing we're getting into now. Um, the last screen on the right there you see on, our, on the slide here is that we're now going to be able to do payments. So if people want to pay a parking ticket or you want to allow them to say there's a, a $5 fee to use a pavilion for your family reunion and you happen to get out to the park and you didn't register ahead of time but there's one open and you wanted to grab it right then, you could snap a photo. Maybe it's got a Q tag on it. You can see the information. You need to use a PayPal account. You pay the $5 fee. The city responds back, hey, it's yours. Here's your registration number. You now have that reserved. But we're getting a lot of requests from customers these days, especially in tight budget times, that says we'd like to do more to capture revenue right away and not let it work through the typical bureaucracy and red tape where we may not see funds paid if people can pay a parking fine while they're on the street reading the ticket with their mobile phone, that's, that's a pretty way, good way to do it. Right now, a lot of our customers, they, they, they have printed on the tickets, call 311 if you'd like to pay for this ticket right now. Again, that requires a person to answer the phone. If we can eliminate having to have someone there to answer the phone but still provide that same customer service, that's great. So on mobile devices, reporting issues, looking up problems, getting alerts and notifications that, hey, the water is out in your area due to a water main break. If a citizen pulls up their mobile device to report it and then there's a message from you that says, hey, no need to report the water break. We're already aware of it. We've now, you know, prevented another request that comes in that we'd have to deal with. So if we can look at ways to be preventative, that's even better. So we look at all those experiences and we, we see how they tie all together. And we really have seen that the customer experience continuum that really uh, is the key thing for us is that with tight budget times, we've got to work through all those experiences and uh, deal with what's the right way to pull the mix together based on what a customer wants to do. And if you're a new city that's approaching this from the first time, you may, you may choose to go the web route and then add on social and mobile and maybe do the agent experience last. A lot of cities that have been around for a while already have the call center and the contact centers. And they've had, you know, maybe attempts at mobile and web, but they like that this hasn't been maybe totally unified or tied together. Now they can look at doing that and bringing it all together. So that's kind of the evolutionary journey we're taking a lot of our customers on. And I'll kind of wrap up with just talking about this. Is one of the key things for us is that we want to protect the investments that have been made. We want to extend what's already there with new solutions as things come along. Uh, a lot of the licensing models that, that kind of that we're using with our lagging products now are, are more subscription types of licenses on top of the traditional buying a software license. Because in some cases, these things change so fast, getting through procurement before the next version of iPhone is out can be tough. So in some cases, it's more beneficial for sit to subscribe, and then we take care of the technology changes, and, and we, we build on the technology that allows the fact that our application will work on any iPhone, and as the next one comes out, we just certify it. And, you don't have to worry about it. So it's protecting what you're investing in and allowing you to extend, and then to converge the best of all the features into a single unified platform. All right, that was uh, my presentation. At this point, I'll hand it uh, I'll hand it back to Andy. That's great, Steve. Um, so uh, Chris, Steve, yeah, that's that's great. Thanks for for taking the time and sharing that. So what I what I take away from from both of these, you know experience you know folks out in the field is that you know the public companies you know with a lot of things they're doing are really setting a stage that we're going to have to try and follow and it's not necessarily a very easy thing to do um, so the public expects us to know you know what we're what they're interested in um, and also you know know what they've done uh, so that when you know when they call in when they want to contact us again they don't they don't repeat it and I think that that's a trend so I don't know if uh, all you out there if your systems are doing that already then something to think about um, the other thing is the proactive engagement and and that's it looks like both on the intake of being able to kind of you know look at what's going on and then proactively engage um, and perhaps selectively engage you know with the public. Um, so those are you know, a couple of my big takeaways. Um, if, are there any other questions anyone's got? I know it's a couple of you know, pretty full featured presentations. Um, if anybody does have any questions, go ahead and you know, throw them into the Q&A and um, we'll get to them. Um, if you're not 
uh, quite sure about what you want to put in the question and answer. Uh, it, again, it's an encouragement for um, – take this encouragement to take a look at your, at your budget, take a look at your travel schedule. Really encourage you to, to make it out to our conference in Tampa at the end of April, um, especially for the folks in northern climates. It's a great excuse to go to Tampa in April, not that you need one. Uh, and if you want to post out to the discussion boards in LinkedIn about any of this and any questions you may have or any things you'd like to see us talk about, you know, in Tampa, looking for your feedback there as well. Um, taking a second to look at questions, and there are no questions. Um, So what I'd like to do again is, is thank everybody uh, for participating, and um, we'll get these slides and the recording you know, posted out on the csweek.org uh, website in a couple days. So a good time for you to go back out there, take a look at the, uh, the schedule for the Synergy Group and the travel uh, accommodations. And again, thank you all of you that dialed in, and I thank uh, both Chris and Steve for you know, giving their time and, and presenting on the on the phone today. And I encourage you to take a look for the upcoming webinar at the end of January. And with that, thank you very much. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, everyone. All right,